Welcome in. This is another 300 yards to unknown episode. And in this one, I get to finally chat with Mark Immelman. And that's a voice that you know, you hear all the time in the world of golf. And Mark and I have, uh, we met first uh, at the end of 2019 uh, on the the First Cut podcast. That's the CBS Sports uh, podcast that I that I host, and we've gotten um, much closer recently. Spent some time together in Las Vegas, and I think what makes our relationship so interesting is that we see the game of golf very, very differently. Uh, I see it through a spreadsheet and through statistics. Mark sees it literally out on the course with these guys, and us uh, able to kind of sponge information from one another has been uh, incredibly valuable and incredibly enlightening. So in this episode, Mark and I are going to go through a variety of topics. Right? He's an instructor, an educator at heart. He's an analyst uh, for CBS on the main broadcast. You'll hear him on PGA Tour Live. And of course, we cap it with a story, and Mark's got plenty of them, a story from Augusta National and the Masters, which is always fun to hear. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy. All right, let me welcome him in. It's the analyst, the instructor. I don't I don't even know how to introduce you properly, Mark, but it's Mark Immelman. Thanks so much for your time. <laughs> Hey, thanks, Rick. You can introduce me as Rick's buddy, uh, Tracy's <laughs> husband, yeah. Trevor's brother. Let's not forget that one. Uh, Isabel Sophia's dad who happens to do a whole bunch of golf stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's good to be with you, man. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Yes, lots of lots of different things we can talk about. I I was going through some ideas for today, and I'm like, okay, maybe I'll maybe I'll do some instruction. Oh no, I want to get some information about what it's like being out on the course with these guys. But I think what this boils down to, Mark, for me, and what I really appreciate about you the most um, is you're a student of the game, and I think you're always trying to learn as much as possible. Um, myself included, right? Like I I'm I'm thirsty for knowledge. I'm thirsty for innovation, and I think that is why uh, you and I jive so well. Yeah, um, you know, I guess the truth of it, Rick, is that golf has just been so good to our family. And um, ever since, because I was a child of South Africa, and we grew up outdoors, and I did all sorts of sports, and I was sort of successful in most of them. And then golf came along, and the proverbial bug bit, and it's just opened doors that I don't think anything else could have i mean it's because of golf that i get to live in america it's because of golf that i got an education in the united states it's because of golf that we've become american citizens um it's because of golf that i met my wife uh, it's it's just it is just this crazy game that everyone loves and hates at the same time <laughs> yet when you play golf you get to meet folks that are, might not be from the same walk of life but we all have the similar thread if you will like a common denominator and it's it's been great and so as a result uh, it's always been a passion of mine to to keep on um you know passing it forward paying it forward if you will and and uh, so as a result I, I take my my responsibility as a teacher and as a broadcaster and an analyst very very seriously because i've been on the receiving end of lessons that i didn't understand or or information that didn't make sense, but I just went with it anyway and mm. ended up tripping me up. So, so yeah, I, I am a student of the game because I want to make sure that whatever I say in any sort of a genre is is well thought out, well researched, all that sort of stuff, because I don't take it lightly. Does that make sense? It does, and and that was kind of uh, my next question. Is is really now now this responsibility that you feel to to pay it forward is is something that I think is is great. And and what's awesome about our sport here is there's a lot of different ways to do it, right? And and mm -hmm. there are um, there's instruction. It's it's getting um, you know even on our even on the first cut podcast that we do for CBS Sports, the insight that you have from the course that most people don't get to see. There are. Yeah. so many ways that we can really pay it forward as a community and continue to grow this so that other people can have uh, the similar feeling that you and I have. It certainly is. I mean, you got to experience this with me here recently and, and that inside the ropes access, um, the access even to, to transcripts from me, press interviews, the access yeah. to players, the access to insights and that sort of stuff is not what a lot of folks get. And it's kind of like with my po podcast too, Oftentimes, that information can unlock other information for people. So, yeah, it's it's a very big deal, and I'm fortunate to be in a place where I can get to talk to good players and I can get to watch them play from up close and and spend extended periods of time with them. 
where you can get context behind the information. Because information is one thing, and I've long said this with my podcast, information is one thing, but the understanding of the information, that sort of parlays itself into wisdom. And if you're wise and you approach things from that point of view, you can make smart decisions. And I feel like a lot of golfers aren't playing their best because maybe they've done something willy-nilly. It's kind of like taking another man's medicine. But if they understand the concept and they understand how they fit into it and all that sort of stuff, then I think smarter decisions are made. And when that's done, then you know success is largely had by all. Yeah, it is. It's it's fascinating. You quickly learn how human all of these guys are. Uh, let's let's go let's go in the ropes. We'll start inside the ropes here, Mark, because you are one of uh, the few people on this planet that gets to walk with uh, the greatest golfers that we have <laughs> in the biggest moment. So let me just pause right there. Isn't that kind of crazy? You are one of what a handful of guys, a handful of of people uh, who walk inside the ropes with the best players in the biggest moments. Think about that. <laughs> it is kind of crazy uh, if you think <laughs> about it from that point of view. And I'm I'm glad you you reiterate that to me because sometimes we can get wrapped up in our own melodrama. Um, like you had the brush with me the other day when I made an announcing mistake, and and and, and one lives in that sort of stuff. So. It, yes, it, it is a thrill. I, I'm thankful to get to do it. I've never thought about it in the context of how few folks get to do it, and it's eye popping that way. But I'll tell you this much: when um, well, we're doing it now. You're sort of not post COVID, but now that we're not as bubbled and locked down as what we used to be. When I sit down at a table with our announce crew from CBS, and it's Hall of Famer Nick Felder, Hall of Famer Jim Nance, arguably the best broadcaster of all time. Uh, Ian Baker Finch, major champion, Hall of Fame human being, Frank Nobolo, Brains Barn, and Dottie Pepper, who's a future Hall of Famer, and me. <laughs> it to make much sense. So, so yeah, it's it's pretty cool, and, and I appreciate you highlighting that. Yeah, absolutely. And there is there is really a true. Um, I don't know if it's a science. It's more of an art, Mark, where you are trying to be out there. You're trying to stay out of the way. You're trying to pass along uh, what you're seeing, and I'm sure there's I'm sure there's techniques for this, right? You want to be close, but not too close. So when you're out there, you're about <laughs> to call a shot. Um, yeah. Is there is it 30, 40 yards? Is it every hole different where you've got to get a good vantage point? What are the types of things that are running through your mind as you're setting up to then relay this message to the viewing audience? Well, the vantage point varies. Uh, we saw that in Las Vegas on a dry, crisp morning when the sound carried some 50, 60 yards. And that's been the challenge um, during the COVID era because whereas the players and everyone rage about the fans, you know, I just like the fans because the ambient noise mm. allows us to be a little closer and it muffles our sound a little bit because we're the only person talking while the player is not necessarily over the ball, but certainly in the, certainly in the launching sequence. So it's, it's a delicate time. So the vantage point is the most important thing. Um, where you locate yourself is important too. But I would say the bulk of my work is done sort of prior to the player hitting the golf ball because I'm watching for interactions, events, things that you're not necessarily, necessarily going to see on television. You know, I'm not doing my job as the on-course guy or as the announcer for that matter if I'm telling you what you see. And it grinds my gears if some announcer on TV goes, well, that's a great shot, landed 15 feet. I'm like, yeah, we can see that. Tell me why. <laughs> and, and, and the why of our job is the important thing. And I guess that's maybe why anyone who's listened to our first cut show or mine, they'll realize I sort of come from a different point of view because that's who I have to be. I'm not going to tell you the obvious that he's played well. I'm going right. to tell you why he might play it well or, or why the shot didn't work out. So, I'm watching players and caddy interaction and how they're walking down the fairways and what their mood is like and all that sort of stuff. And, and so I'm watching players between balls and before the shot, if there's like a hiccup with club selection or any of that sort of stuff, that's where my information comes from. And uh, once the ball's airborne, it's out of my hands. And it makes a lot of sense, but I don't think I would have thought that. Right. Tell us things we 
can't see on our mm -hmm. own. That makes a lot of sense. What some of the stuff that that you're right, and even before you know, even before it cuts to the shot, you know, most of the times the golfer he might be already have addressed the golf ball or something like that. There's a lot that goes into the two minutes before that shot uh, actually goes off. I'll give you a great example. Obviously, we were in uh, Vegas for for two weeks here. I was I was with I was following around Scotty Scheffler, and him and his caddy are talking about hitting a flop shot greenside. He gets up there, he's addressed the ball. He backs off of it, completely changes the style of shot. And that's the type of stuff that you would not have seen on uh, yeah. on, on television, on the broadcast, but you're there to say, okay, he's now going to go with a bump and run. There was a little bit of indecision here. That's the stuff that actually provides a lot of value and context to the shot that we're about to see. It is true. I mean, I, I sort of keep myself grounded in a way by going to like let's say you and i went to the sports book together or we went to a sports bar and we're sitting having a drink and we can watch sport on television with the sound down because of the noise in the place and you yeah. know exactly what's happening you can see by the images and you can see by the graphics what the score is and, and you can see the action where the announcer is supposed to enhance that stuff so you're right i mean like the the interaction with scheffler where they're in one way and then they go in there and he bails out the last minute. That's important because it, it could be a situation there now to get to your, your statistical um, <laughs> point of view where he doesn't get it up and down, hits a crappy pitch shot and strokes gain show. Well, no, he's not very good at chipping where, right. you know, it could have been something else and his mind's going haywire and he suddenly looks down and is like, well, this is not happening. I've got to find another way to try and skin the cat. So yeah, it is real. And, and so that's where us um, as the on-course crew, and I feel like CBS do a great job of it. We, 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 we build on the images. We don't tell you what the images are. I like that. Um, and for the record, Scotty Scheffler uh, did hit a crappy one. It wasn't very good. He was not. <laughs> he was. He was not committed to that shot. Um, okay. One of the things that I think is is really interesting while you're out there is that um, you are actually getting relayed. And correct me if I'm wrong here. For the most part, uh, the club selection from the caddy themselves is that. Am I yeah. correct so far? <laughs> that is correct. I mean, okay. I, when I'm working for CBS, I have a spotter out there uh, who travels with me. I have. I sound like a diva, but I've got a driver who drives a cart around. Um, and then I have, a, I have a spotter and there's an advanced person that radios, you know, shot order and stuff in. And they'll watch where the ball lands and they'll point it out. Then me and my spotter will show up in the spotter. Um, I have a guy that I work with, Craig. It's either Craig or Greg for CBS. And they get yardages and they can get close to the player. And so they can have a peek in the bag if we're not getting signals from the caddy. Um, and so I'll always get a club signal, um, which is important because if they're changing between clubs or whatever the case might be, or um, let's say the player normally hits a 7 iron 175, and now it's 175, carry, and he suddenly decided to go with, oh, I don't know, 6 iron, mm -hmm. then you sort of know, okay, he's trying to create something in terms of shot making. So I get signals. Um, when I work for live, we don't have a spotter out there, but I have a, a relationship with most caddies where they'll give signals to you, like um, yeah. five irons accepted, and then that okay. could be six, seven, eight, nine. One I knew is it. A fist. Yeah. Okay, so that's and that's what it. I saw. That's what I saw at Summerlin the other day. Uh, so they were playing. I guess it was fourteen, the par three on the back. It's like one hundred and forty yards, and I saw. Uh, it might have been Victor Hovland's caddy. He gave. I think he gave this, which is obviously not a four iron. It's a that's nine, nine iron. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Four, four up would, or four, four would be upside down. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So if you're not four watching on YouTube, <laughs> yeah. So there's yeah. there's different ways to do this. Four up like this, like it's just holding nine. it up would be a nine iron. This would be a four iron. And I guess Mark, there is a common sense, right? If the guy's 140 yards away, he's probably not hitting a, not a three him. iron or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's it, it's it's really helpful. A lot of the caddies are good about it. And you, but you must be understanding. I mean, there's certain guys that that are loath to give signals but their players have called them off and they're like no let's not do that um but other guys they're pretty good at it but there's certain situations like when these guys are under the gun and you're coming down the final round there and he's sweating a yardage or whatever he, he's mm -hmm. not thinking of the golf course announce guy to show him right. what club he's hitting he's sitting there going sweet jesus let me be this really right selection so my guy hits this thing onto the green and we can get out here with a birdie or a par so yeah, it's 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 cool interactions and it's great when you've got a, a caddy that's aware of it but oftentimes i'm like harry diamond for argument's sakes uh he's 
he's gotten better. And when I talked to him in Vegas here recently, he goes, man, I'm sorry if I missed you a few times. I just don't think about it. And I'm like, yeah. no sweat, brother, whenever you think about it. But oftentimes when I'm out in front of them, I'll stand and I'll just raise my hand and I'll just kind of hold my hand out with what I think it's going to be. And then I'll get a confirmation from them. So you can cue them a little bit if they're looking your way. All right. That makes that makes a lot of sense. And there are there, I'm sure, have been uh, more memorable, memorable moments than others. I know you were there for Justin Thomas's 59. That probably <laughs> jumps to top of mind. Are there is there a short list of moments that you're like, wow, I, I cannot believe I was walking around for that. <laughs> um, there are a couple. Well, there are a few, actually. I mean. A lot of them involve Tiger Woods, as you would expect. Sure. Um, but there's a Rory McIlroy one. I mean, I was on course um, calling his final round 64 at Bay Hill that he shot to win. And I would argue that it's one of the best rounds of golf I've ever seen. Um, mm. Just just virtuoso. I mean, the guy was like a symphony walking around there. And, and everything was working. And he was at that gear that very few players have. And I count myself fortunate to see it. Like when JT shot that 59 in Hawaii, for argument's sake, he was good, but the golf course was sort of playing easy, or, um, and he's long enough to get at the fives and stuff like that, and you make a few putts, and it was very comfortable. It was in the opening round alongside Daniel Berger and Jordan Spieth. But when you Bay Hill, which is a beast, final round, chilly outside, blustery, and Rory shoots 64 to lap the field was, was pretty special. Um, <laughs> this one's top of mind for me because... I got an email last night, like sometimes our calls get used by other organizations and the CBS for argument's sakes or the tour own the rights to it, but mm -hmm. they'll still approach the announcer and say, is it okay if they use the sound? Now they use Nance and the sort of company all the time and I get used periodically at best, but I was on the call um, down in Mexico on Tiger's final hole. It was the ninth going up the hill. And he was in a bunker behind this gnarled old dead tree and he had nothing from like 160 up the hill. Yeah. And I set it up to go, well, you know, I don't see much, but he is Tiger. And all of a sudden <laughs> he gets out the bunker and I see him making this huge slicing practice swing. Yeah. And I know that I can see the cameras on him because I'm watching the camera guys and the one camera guy's looking straight down his line and the other guy's looking at him at like an angle like this. So I know that you're seeing the practice swings. So I sort of set it up or reflect. Like, you know, Tiger's looking to slice this thing. And I set it up like that. And I, I said something to that effect. And the announcer goes, well, can he? And I'm like, well, he's got to move it 40 yards and it's uphill. The lie is good. And he's Tiger Woods kind of thing is what I said. Right. And he hits this shot and it comes out like a bullet. I mean, it took off and you can see it start to fade. And I had the sideline view of the thing. And I'm like, it's cutting. <laughs> and it hits the green and it hits the brakes and turns sideways. Yeah. And I'm like, shot of the day, shot of the day. And now they've asked to use this thing in some Bridgestone commercial in Japan. <laughs> so that one stands out. So that one stands out to me. Um, and then also with Tiger at the tour championship a few years ago, I was on the course for live and I had the Tiger and Rory group. And Tiger was now trying to get back into the winner's circle. Mm. And it was that final hole there where now he had sort of taken care of business and Rory had capitulated a little bit and Tiger hits the final ball there on the green and he starts walking down the fairway and the fans start streaming in behind him, like the open. Yeah. And I can see our cameras on watching this and I'm like, well, this is what a scene basically is what I'm saying. There's folks falling in behind him. It looks like the open championship and I can see the cameras quickly pivot toward him. And I'm sure the higher cameras got him and stuff. And then all of a sudden the folks break over the ropes. They're like, screw it. We want a part of this. And they get over right. the ropes in front of him and it turns into mayhem. And my daughter, Isabel was out there with me. She sometimes spots. So she'll get yardages and club signals and stuff. And I looked at her, I'm like, just go stand over there. Cause folks now were up to the green. Yeah. Line. Yeah. And she's standing underneath the scoreboard and I get up there and the folks are going bananas. I mean, it's just mayhem. And I radio my producer. I'm like, just lay out. You, I'm not sure what you'll hear in my microphone right now, so I'm not going to say another word. Um, and I go and grab my daughter. And I remember her standing in front of me going, why are they doing this, Daddy? And I was like, I don't know, but it's cool, isn't it? And oh. the whole car ride home that evening, my dad called up and he said, Isabel, do you understand that you were part of history over there? And so that one was especially memorable just to see 
you know, Tiger break into the winner's circle again in Atlanta, which is almost my hometown. Just the fans loving it. It, it was pretty cool. That is that is goosebumps uh, stuff right there. That's very cool. And hey, maybe you'll be famous uh, in Japan when that commercial finally, <laughs> finally hits. You'll be the guy. Um, what what I think is fascinating uh, in our conversations here in recent weeks, and obviously we got to connect in Las Vegas, and it was an absolute pleasure. But just being able to try to adjust my mind from golf happens in a spreadsheet. Everything can be defined by a number to, mm -hmm. oh my God, there's a million variables that can never be quantified. And, and you yeah. be, you kind of, uh, being my shepherd in, in that, uh, in that area of being able to learn. There's so much stuff going on out here. There's so much that, uh, we're never going to see in the statistics. There's a lot of stuff mm -hmm. that, again, th these guys are just human. Right. And sometimes they wake up in a bad mood and sometimes they wake up and their back hurts and you being able to kind of, um, you know, enlighten me on kind of the human aspect of it has been one of my larger steps uh, of growth in this game. So I thank you for that. Well, well it's my pleasure. I, I know I sort of can sound cantankerous maybe and grumpy about it at times, <laughs> but I, I guess it's, it's the defender in me of golf and of the human mm -hmm. being playing it because. The one thing I know for certain is that we're human beings deep down. And then I also know for certain is that you can't necessarily trust your heroes. Um, they just like you and me, and they do some silly stuff at times too um, because of pressure and because of environmental circumstance and all that sort of thing. So there's so many things that are working on their psyche and their emotions and their mindset when they're playing. And even before and after they're playing, it, it it doesn't make it as black and white as what it can appear to be. And like we were talking statistics, I'm, I'm into statistics because I find it fascinating and I find it enlightening. And for me as an instructor also, it's a way if you look at a, a period or a, a sample of statistics, it can direct work. Like because golfers too in our mind, we can make ourselves think we're worse than or better mm. than we currently, we, we really are in, a, a given area of the game but then you look at the statistics over a period of time you get, can be like well dang i'm not as good a bunker player as what i thought i was or <laughs> something like that so if you take it truthfully from that point of view um it sort of can direct work but then when it comes to weekly golf and daily golf i mean you saw we had justin thomas who's arguably one of the better iron players in the world right yeah. i mean well statistics say so he couldn't hit the broads out of a barn for the first three hours of the round of golf because that's right. just how golf is. It could be lies. It could be in between yardages. It could be anything going on. It could be announcers that the sound is carrying <laughs> inside <laughs> joke there, folks. So, um, it, 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 it is a very volatile deal, and golf is mercurial, and human beings are. So, so statistics are helpful, but you, I've, I've always maintained, and I, I will to my grave, that in as much as what it makes you a very good, good at what you do and, and, and great at, you know, gambling and such, you, I, I wouldn't hang my hat on this stuff because you never know. I mean, and then of course it's injury. And if you listen to that first yeah. podcast enough, you'll hear me talk about someone avoiding injury more than anything else, because that's also very real. And, and I do think it's interesting that now we're in a world where obviously, uh, you know, technology is driving uh, a lot of the statistics that we're even able to capture. I imagine that is bleeding into the instruction realm as well. I see you post mm -hmm. stuff all the time where now you've got uh, yeah. angles of every body part and every like, mm -hmm. like how has how has technology kind of allowed for change in the instruction aspect of of golf? Well, oh, you know, it's, <laughs> I would say it's changing every day. I mean, yeah. on this very phone that I'm talking to you now, there's an app called Sportsbox. It's AI, and I can take a slow-mo video of your golf swing, and in about 90 seconds, it can turn you into a virtual version of yourself, and we can move <laughs> you around any place, and it shows every measurement at every minute, so any, every second of your swing. And then I've got... Another little deal I use called the DeWiz Golf app, which is sort of like an iPhone, I, I watch, okay. I should say, and it tracks your hand path and it talks about tempo, pace of swing, width of swing. It shows you path of swing. And this is stuff where old time instructors, me-ish and beyond me, because I'm sort of a bridge between the old and the new, 
um, we were making educated guesses back then because mm -hmm. we respond to what the ball's doing. But now you almost get MRIs on every golfer if you need it. So instead of the, the, the instructor going, well, this, and then you can, you're in the right area, but you're sort of trying to put your finger on it. Now you can go there right away with all this information and go, here's where it is. And it's not necessarily because, like statistics, I would say it's most folks will look at the symptom instead of the cause. So they'll say, well, he's putting badly. So, so he goes, well, we're going to change his putting where there could be something different involved there. And with instruction, people have got to be a bit careful not to just look at the thing and go, well, okay, my, the hand was too high over there. There's mm -hmm. a cause for that. I mean, I could be a doctor of, as well if I just told you, oh, well, you've got a snivelly nose. I'm going to give you medicine for that. Right. There's something causing that. So, so, so that's where the technology has certainly helped. But you still have to go have the savvy and the know-how to be able to understand where the issue has its genesis. And then from there, make the appropriate adjustment to, to get the numbers that you're looking for. And what I find even more fascinating is that there is a – percentage i don't know if it's a small percentage or a large percentage of in, of golf instruction happening mark remotely where you yeah. are not even with the guy taking a swing he just either or, or 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 girl they just send you the swing you can obviously analyze it but that is now seemingly getting more and more popular obviously with covid but now it seems like there is access to instructors uh basically no matter where you are right Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, heck, the COVID pandemic opened this market up. It was happening some, um, but like I was approached by an Australian guy called Baden Shaft, super smart. He began an app, which was basically a platform, online platform for instructors to gather. And, and so you in Vegas could uh, get on the app, pick your instructor, send the videos. They mm -hmm. send, send back a detailed swing analysis for you and you pay your lesson fee, which is <laughs> awesome because right. like, uh, you might not be able to meet X instructor ever. Right. Um, it, it, so it certainly has its advantages. And if it's used correctly, it can be very helpful. The thing that is lost in translation there, but the one thing about Skillist is that they allow is you can have like a live FaceTime lesson with mm. the guy or, or okay. girl. So you're getting that real-time feedback. Um, so they, they, they have covered their base there, but there are certain things always that are lost in translation a little bit. But the truth is, I mean, those things could be lost in translation if the guy's standing next door to you. So, 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 so it's a really good format. I just know what I would do is I would uh, hit a hundred shots. I would take my best one and then send it to you, <laughs> which I should really be sending you like my worst one. You know what I mean? I'm just like, I'll wait till I pure one. Then I'll send it. And it'll be all good. But I imagine I would, uh, I would not get the benefit of it out of that. <laughs> well, well, if you send, if you send, if someone sends me a video, I send back. Not a detailed questionnaire, but I send you back questions, which gives me further insight into who you are, what happens mm. when you're good, when you're bad, all that sort of thing. So we sort of cover the bases there a little bit. And it's kind of like that golfer that, you know, goes and tests a golf club in dicks or whatever. And they hit this thing and it goes great. And they hit mm -hmm. a few shots that go 260 and they're like, yeah, this is the club for me. I'm more interested in the balls that go 160 um, and to see if the club's going to help you with your bad stuff. So. So, so because of that, there are very lots of questions I will ask before we do it. So I kind of know who you are a little bit more. And asking questions is something you are very, very good at. Your podcast, the On the Mark podcast, is one that I have. Uh, I, we were talking about this at dinner the other night. Like there, there are things that have stuck with me for eighteen months, two years that I have that mm -hmm. I have learned on there. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, your goal, uh, as uh, we're starting to see a trend here, it's it's teaching, it's it's educational, it's it's asking questions from a from a perspective that maybe others would not have asked them, and then in turn that pulls out a a lot of really good responses and a lot of really good information. Yeah, I'm a teacher deep down. That's who I am. I've been a co college coach for 20 years. Uh, I've taught golf since 1996. Um, so that's sort of who I am. I've, I've been a decent player in my time. So I play, approach instruction from a playing sort of a point of a view. Um, but yes, you, you'll, you'll, you'll hear the teaching bent in my analysis. You'll hear it in my uh, announcing because that's who I am. And the one thing I know kind of for certain is that no matter what show a golfer is listening to, 
they well, this is where you're important. They kind of want to make money and they want to play good golf. So if they if they get good information on who to lay their their, their dollars on, you're the guy, and then they they also want to go beat their buds on the golf course. So everyone's looking for the next golf tip. Mm-hmm. So if you can you know lay stuff with the odd golf tip or odd golf insight, folks like that because people just want to play better. And uh, and and I'm a teacher, and so I take again take that very responsibility very seriously. And it was sort of the origin of my podcast, really. Yeah, fascinating, and it is um, it is true. Uh, a lot of listeners, a lot of viewers, they want to know what they can get out of something. So at least we can bring them uh, a little bit of that. Mark, you've been very gracious with your time today, but I we we cannot let you go here uh, without getting an Augusta National story, and I'm sure you have plenty of them because you are again one of the few handful of people that uh, have had access to this place that most people can only dream of going to. And I know that there are both uh, in tournament moments, maybe some out of tournament moments. That you have experienced that few have and uh, i'm just going to ask you to leave us with with one augusta national or masters story i know you have them in okay <laughs> I do. Um, i'm gonna give you a gripe first off okay. and then i'll tell you a wow. story all right first off pardon me that's cletus my dog barking over there <laughs> um yeah cletus is he thinks he's the boss of that <laughs> the whenever i'm on the announced career augusta national because uh, I do the Amen Corner show. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, look, there, there's an influence all the way around that course from hole one through hole 18, where in the even in the yardage book, the official yardage book, they have a spot on the green where that points towards where Ray's Creek, the okay. area right behind 11 green and in front of 12 green, that's the lowest part of the golf Lowest course. spot on the course, they, right? Yeah. They dot that area. So you know okay. where it is on the green because everything moves in that direction. You speak to local caddies, they make a read for you, and you're looking right edge, and they're like, no, nah, Grace Creek is that way. This one's moving from the left-hand side. Okay. Like, Can't be. It's real. <laughs> and then I say this, and then I get ripped by some all-knowing fool on Twitter that doesn't even know where Augusta, Georgia is on a map. Okay? <laughs> Let me tell you something, Rick, and you can help me with this. The influence of Race Creek is real, and that's why we've talked about this on the, uh, the, the First Cut podcast before. There's nuance to Augusta National, and you've got to know that place. And that's why you find the same people contending there because they've yes. sort of figured out the, the the conundrum, the puzzle of it, because there's a mystery to the place. And, and one of those mysteries is Ray's Creek and its influence. So, folks, when you hear me say that again, <laughs> trust me, I'm not just trying to fill air. It is for real. And if you ever get to play there, I hope you do you will notice and the first thing you'll realize is you listen to your local caddy because they know what they're talking about yeah i would never i I would never be like if i had a local caddy at augusta i would hit it or at least try to hit it wherever the heck they tell me to right i'm not i'm not crazy here (laughs) isn't it crazy i mean when golfers go and practice the place before tournament week they take local caddies because the local caddy will give them the insights on the course now these are the top golfers in the world yet some Numwit on Twitter is trying to tell me that Ray's Creek's influence isn't real. I'm like, come on, man. So that's number one. And number two, um, I well, obviously my brother went in 2008 and that was moving. It's, it's still moving for me. Um, but what folks don't know is that the members on the even the Sunday eve of the uh, tournament finishing, the members have a party and they have a party for the champion and the champion and his family. And um, it's unreal how they throw the thing out because every all the members are there, all in their green jackets and stuff, and they're just there. It's their decompressed time after a lot of long days for them because they're there in service yeah. to the patrons. And so Trevor wins, and we get invited to this party. He does media before the time, and myself and my wife, my mom, my dad, and Trevor's wife, that was sort of our party. We were entertained, and in um, the Eisenhower cabin, I believe it was, with like cocktails and stuff like that. And then we get walked over up the stairs to where they had the members party and you got the stairs and they've got your table set up and it's all name tags and stuff like that. And we coming straight off the course, okay, we've got golf clothes on and here's all the the members in their green coats and stuff. And um, then the the, then, so it's awesome. I mean, and, and, and the dinners, the dinner is samplings from all of the previous champions champions meals 
Nice. So okay. there, was su- there was sushi from Mac Ware and there was all sorts of stuff. That's so cool. Every year there's a little something extra. And, you know, great wines and stuff like that. And um, then, then Chairman Billy Payne got up and he's on a little stage there. And he calls Trevor up and he introduces him. You know, he does the pleasantries and stuff. And, you know, the, the chairman of Augusta National swings a big stick. <laughs> and uh, they, 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 they've got a lot of decorum and they're just you know, powerful men. But they're real genteel about what they do. And Chairman Payne looks at Trevor and he goes, Trevor, congratulations. And by this stage, I mean, I, I cry at the drop of a hat. So I get tears <laughs> streaming down my face. He has my brother in the green jacket. And he looks at him and he goes, congratulations from all of the membership to you. And everyone stands and cheers for him. And, and then he goes, we've got a gift for you. And that gift is just to say thank you for what you're going to do as our champion. Um, sort of like to say, right. no, you're the champion. This is, you're going to it's a responsibility a now. Respect. Yeah, exactly. And he unveils this picture that's probably six feet high and about two, uh, three feet wide. Big, big, I mean, life size. And these, in the middle of this picture, there was, uh, it was a pr- it was a print, a picture of Trevor with a sort of raising his biceps like this, like he did when he realized he won. And around him, there's a picture of my dad from the course and me and my wife oh, and wow. the whole family. And they've turned this thing around because he won at 6 p.m. And this function was at like 8 p.m. <laughs> this thing framed, they've, they've turned this thing around in the blink of an eye. Think about it, because the photos were yeah. from the final the photos were from the final green that they've turned into this beautifully painted collage and i looked at this i was like wow i mean this is you talk about the things that augusta national do to pull yeah. off that painting in that space of time is just mind-numbing only and, augusta um, national could pull something like that off <laughs> yeah, etc. so we have a fantastic evening and you meet the members and they all come up to the champion and he signs all of their their, their um menus mm-hmm. so they will keep their memento there's so much tradition there and then everyone we we make our way out there and so we're walking out towards the parking area and it's just the perfect evening it's dark and they've got all the all the there's no lights there those gas lanterns you know and the black black gas lanterns around the place so it's just perfectly mm-hmm. lit and you can see the clubhouse is lit up and we're walking sort of across um the founders square to the parking and magnolia lane is this way and so Trevor looks at me and he goes, something to the effect of, well, how about that? And I was like, <laughs> dude, cheese. <geez." laughs> and um, he goes, I'd let you try on the jacket, but I'm scared I'll get into trouble. So let's wait until we get home. <laughs> <laughs> and he's probably so, right. Uh, he probably would get in trouble. <laughs> um, but they, I mean, it's amazing how the folks are so relaxed about it, but there's so much respect for the place and respect for the green jacket and for the members and stuff. So we went home and, you know, we got home and had a, at this stage, it's like 11 something in the evening. And he had to fly to New York at like 6am the following morning. So we had a, couple of glasses of champagne and i tried on the green jacket and it is it is heavenly and light and just fits perfectly and it feels like it feels like you've died and gone to heaven when you put it on so so that's my insider story unbelievable i can certainly mm-hmm. not follow that up that's that's perfect that was uh exactly <laughs> what i was looking for i didn't know what story i was going to get out of you i hadn't heard that one that's a very good one <laughs> um mark you have been uh gracious with your time you've been gracious with your with your knowledge uh we will continue to chat obviously on the first cut podcast and uh i'm hoping that uh we cross cross paths again in person uh before i know it Likewise, and I'm looking forward to getting you on my show so you can share some of the wisdom. Thanks for having me. It's been a thrill. Looking forward. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Mark. There you go. A fun ride with Mark. Always appreciated. You can follow Mark uh, on Twitter and Instagram. Both of those usernames are Mark underscore Immelman. Give him a follow. Lots of of great information and knowledge uh, coming out of those social accounts. If these episodes are ones that you enjoy, go ahead and let me know. Uh, You can tweet at me at Rick Run Good. You can leave uh, a five-star rating and review. Certainly not going to not going to hurt you for doing that. Uh, But otherwise, I hope you enjoyed and I'll catch you next time.